So what uh, uh, what do you want to do with this one? Well, we got a Continue. request on one of our yeah. videos underneath the video yeah. that we did. Um, we got a request to talk about the simulation hypothesis, which yeah, okay. I'm hoping you know something about because I'm only faintly acquaint acquainted with it. Um, I know a little. I, I kind of understand it in principle, but um, so, I mean, I guess t to me this is sort of an opportunity to explain pragmatism. Great. Well, okay. Um, let, let me give you my interpretation of what the yeah. uh, simulation hypothesis is. You can tell me if you agree, and then at least that way the audience will know, and we yeah. can get rid of a bunch of assumptions, which will probably save us problems later on. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, the simulation hypothesis is the idea that human beings are going to invent really fancy computers at some yeah. point, and eventually they are going to be so good that uh, we're going to be able to simulate worlds uh, uh, just as powerful as ours or at least so good that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference and when that happens very likely we're going to be incentivized to make millions of the buggers so on a pure purely mathematical statistical level um, given the total number of simulations in the universe yeah. however many that is it's more than one whereas the number of universes there are there's only one of those so almost certainly Statistically speaking, we're in a simulation, not in the yeah, quote unquote I'm, real world. Okay, hopefully this will be good. I might, um, I might end up annoying you. <laughs> I ask the question quite a lot. <laughs> That's um, all right. We don't promise our viewers anything except not wasting no. their time and not talking down to them. So it's if, fine. I know that's not be a problem. But if anything, I'm. Um, yeah, you'll see. Like it, the, I'm not a transhumanist either. Yeah, I, I see problems with that. Same. Um, and I see problems with. AI and I see the problems of the idea of like endless progress leading to a, a utopia. Sure. Uh, but just on the level of, is that your understanding of what the basic argument of the simulation hypothesis is? Um, or? Yes, except that it could also bring an alien technology into play, in which case it just, you know, gets sillier and sillier. <laughs> like we might be in a, um, we, there might be no human beings in the first place and we might be, um, created by we might be someone's like ant nest plaything right so this is the danger yeah, of yeah. these kind of like wild mathematical speculations yeah and oh, my, my biggest problem with the, the simulation hypothesis is we can probably invent an endless number of these statistical arguments <laughs> yeah well that's one yeah yeah in which case yeah. i find the explanatory potential zero or maybe even yes yeah, exactly yeah but a fun idea to play around with so let's do that cool let me know when you've hit record um well i've been recording for a few minutes now I have you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So are we officially starting? <laughs> I probably should have let you know, but once we... Um... Okay, so... <laughs> no, okay. it's fine. Okay, cool. So, um, ask me the question. Um, what do you think of the simulation hypothesis? Okay. So, I'm a pragmatist, and um, in pragmatism, the idea is that you should outline what is true should understand what is true by what you can do in the world with it. So if you can cause real change in the world, then it's something um, interesting. And if you can't, it's not that it's not interesting, it's just that it's not going to have an impact on us. And therefore, if you can't possibly make a change in the world, then how can it be really considered true? The thing I like about pragmatism is it twists us off into more interesting conversation place. So I get this a lot, especially because I'm a public wizard and I get lots of questions about magic. And I get asked, um, I also heckle with atheists and um, sort of fundamentalist Christians and all sorts of things on the street a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I've made friends with both of those types of people. And you get a lot of hypothetical questions like, you know, the moral ones, like if you had a button and like on one side of the train track, there's several cute doggies and on the yeah, other yeah, side, yeah. there's like some small children. <laughs> it's like, yeah. which button would you press? And so I object to the idea that, um, and hopefully this doesn't seem like I'm avoiding the question because I will get into it, 
but I checked the idea that an extreme hypothetical should give um, you any kind of clear understanding of the morality of, or, or understanding other person's world. Hypotheticals mm -hmm. can only really just be fun. And the more hypothetical, the more hypotheticals are only as useful as they are realistic. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to start with that. But my qu question is, I'd want to know what is meant by simulation so I know what kind of hypothetical we're dealing with. Is it possible for me as a creature in the simulation to figure out I am definitely in this simulation? And if it is not possible, then life continues as normal because it doesn't cause any change in my world. Yeah, it's one of those if true, don't care answers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so the, there's sort of this, I think we're getting into the idea of transhumanism, potentially AI, and this idea of progress. Mm -hmm. So I strongly suspect that the concept of progress and by this i mean the idea that a newer things are generally better than old things that technology is leading us ever towards a, a better more exciting world i think this is an interesting um thing and i think it's based on gnosticism hmm. i think it's actually repurposed uh, part of christian Gnost gnosticism and the idea um Firstly, of the idea of having a God of revelation, kind of revelation sort of thing, the having an end of the world um, where certain people who are godly ascend into the sky and then there's like this time on earth that is difficult. But the idea of this, um, sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but the idea of this That's religious good. idea is that we end up with God's kingdom on earth. Mm. Now, depending on who you ask, um, which is a, a utopia. It's the, it's the founding myth of a utopia, from what I understand. It's this Christian kind of eschatology. Mm. So to me, the idea of transhumanism, one has this idea of progress behind it that I think is falling apart as a worldview. Like I, really, I think if you talk to an intelligent 16-year-old now, I think they no longer believe believe this it's just we are modernists you and i grew up in a modernist era mm. we, we're the um i'm 39 so i remember you know lots of tv programs on tv like beyond 2000 and things like this with technology hitting is it, look, technology will save everything it will fix the environment it will end war it will make us a model or give us longer lifespans and everything now i'm not saying that these things aren't a little bit true like but I, I think as far as the big problems of our age, like the environmental problem, um, and by that I mean not just global warming, but plastics in the ocean and affecting of so soils and, um, and unsustainable industrial farming and all of those questions, I think they're going to require a value change and not just a technolo technological change. Mm -hmm. I think the oil crisis is going to require a value shift away from burning more and more and more fossil fuels which are 500 million years of stored sunlight that we've burned in like less than okay. 100 years but here's my thing my interpretation yeah. of progressivism is yeah. not only technological it's also moral so yeah. what it looks like you've just done to me is reject technological progressivism but retained moral progressivism um, well, I was going to, so one side leads to, one side believes that it will lead us to utopia. And then the flip side of that is that it will lead us to dystopia. And that's mm. where you get, so if you look at science fiction nowadays, it's gone from Star Trek, which is the utopian vision to like, you know, Terminator 2 and it's only, and then like Black Mirror and it's all dystopia, dystopia, dystopia. And this is because we're no longer modernists. We're losing our uh, faith in it in many ways. What about H.G. Wells and uh, Morlocks and all of that kind of stuff? I mean, I don't know. I suppose there was dystopians, but I agree with your general thrust. That you... that's, yeah, so that, that's uh, my understanding is that idea of a world that's gone sour, but then it's saved by the underground race. That, um, I've the Illoy? Yeah. 
Yeah. I've heard that idea coming up again um, recently, the idea that there's a breakaway civilization that has secret knowledge and it's creating UFOs and it's creating all this high technology stuff and they'll uh, come, uh, and uh, when the world's gone to shit, they'll come out and save us again. But you see how it's just um, revelatory apocalyptic stuff again. It's religious. All of these ideas are religious. Well, yeah, the idea that the illuminated gnomes of Zurich are going to fly their UFOs out of a big hole in Antarctica after the end of the world and everything's going to be okay again after that. I mean, clearly that's just, yeah, a repurposed biblical revelationism. I'll give now, you that. The transhumanist one is Gnostic. This is one where I could probably ground it in a bit more in, in science and stuff. When you but say Gnostic. the words Gnostic, do, by, do you mean by that the same thing that I understand by it, which is that the universe is divided into a good half and a bad half, yeah. and we have to reject all the bad half and accept all of the good yes. half? And the bad half is the, is the material. Right. And the good half is the spiritual. Yeah, so this is where this dem, uh, demiurge comes in. Like somehow so God not... accidentally well, that... makes a second being that tricks us all into staying in the material world somehow. Well, the idea that your body is the yeah, well, exactly. You've got this. You're stuck in a meat meat body, mm -hmm. and what? And it's like we should reject our meat bodies and become pure information, so that we can live forever and take any form. Right, which is like. just um, bourgeoisism again. Um, yes, the... it's also mis it's also these people haven't looked at um, current neuroscience either. Right, and I just recently um, published an article called why you are not just your brain mm -hmm. on pragmatic magic thinking dot blogspot and your your computations as a human being your cognition is not just done in your head so if we just if we just start with the neural processes you've got everyone knows there's a brain in your skull um some people know that some of the things we do don't require a brain like some reflexes and things like pulling your hand away from a hot element on a stove uh, fires for, to my understanding from the spinal cord mm -hmm. and so it is when a doctor like taps your knee with a hammer to see if you've got a knee jerk reflex fires from the spinal cord so some comp some um, cognition happens in the spinal cord then you have something called the enteric um, neural system which is around your gut so I think there's something like 50 billion neurons in your brain. I think there's something like 600 million around your gut. Mm -hmm. So there's some cognition happening there. Now we used to, we've known that for a while, but we didn't realize till recently that the vagus nerve that connects your gut to your brain is way thicker and has way more traffic, information traffic than we realize. So it suggests that your gut is actually part of your subconscious and, and yeah, um, well, Carl Gustav and, Kairos, when he was first investigating the body, and he's a yeah. like phenomenal um, uh, biologist. In fact, yeah. he named a huge proportion, gave Latin names to a huge proportion of the species that exist, as oh, well yeah. as being a fantastic um, painter. Um, what time was he around? Uh, I think sort of the early 1800s is when he did most of his work. Oh, okay. But I'd recently read his book, Psyche, and in that he performs an amazing um, analysis where he looks for the human soul inside the body. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion that he comes, for, comes to is it's the nervous system, essentially, and that the nervous system is um, interacting with a set of what he calls organs, like, for example, your belly and your thigh muscles and, yeah. and your gonads and those sorts of things. And that's where he places the unconscious is so the soul occupies the area which is something like the subconscious and the unconscious occupies the body and the conscious mind is where you're like ego and okay. name that kind of thing I'm getting, is. Somewhere. I'm getting yep. somewhere with it but that's just the beginning great um the last the last two things that where cognition happens are um in a brain-like way is that there's another some odd three three uh, 200 million neurons or something around your heart yeah, wow. Apparently your heart does some cognition. This is new new knowledge. We don't mm -hmm. know much about why. Mm -hmm. So this means that some, yeah, processing, neural processing is not just happening in your head. It's extended throughout a few organs. Mm -hmm. And if we've just discovered the heart 
and this is getting speculative, one wonders if it extends out into the body further. But then we've got, we don't, we don't need to keep a model of everything in our head that you, when you're learning to walk when you're a small child, you're, you're only learning to operate the body you already have. You don't need to keep the size and shape of your body initially in your head. It's like when you're, when you're learning to ride a bike, you don't need to first measure every part of the bike. Yeah. You just learn the ways that which it resists your pedaling and resists you. For this reason, we are always in process with the outside world. So let me uh, get back to where, where we're getting the implications yep. of this. The AI people, they don't get a human being by copying the brain. Yeah, if you, if you take a um, physical, or if, if you take all of the information that is inside the brain yes. and duplicate it and place it onto a silicon you a substrate, you don't no. get a human being. All you get is a really, really, really degraded photocopy of something. Basically, like taking, like uh, looking at the electromagnetic field of a human body in a, one of those ECG machines or something like that, you basically get a CAT scan. You get, like, even if we're going with them and say, yes, you get a processor. It's like you're getting, okay, firstly, they're going to need to copy these other parts of your body in order to get the full human processing power. Because mm -hmm. apparently it just doesn't all happen in your head. You also need a spinal cord. You also need the enteric nervous mm -hmm. system. You also, and you may need the one around your heart. Um, Although we're not sure, we have done heart transplants on people, so this is a little speculative. Sure. Then um, things change in people when they lose body parts and stuff. So it's like, how much of the human being do you need to keep it a human? I imagine and a transhumanist. At least more than the brain. But yeah. then we didn't evolve or grow up or learn anything as a brain we are in the environment so the mind i consider something much more abstract it's not a thing it's not located in space it's a process that's why people are associated with the spirit and the soul so mm. i think i think basically for my purposes and i've never had a problem with this with reading anything all through history i think a mind and a soul and a psyche are all roughly the same thing. Mm. So at the moment, um, my mind is reaching out through the communication lines through to your, your headphones. So in a sense, I already am in the room with you. Yeah. And, and Victor's in the room with me. And therefore, our, my mind is not physically... Well, it's physically there in the room with you, but not as an object, as a process that you're interacting with. So in this way... The brain is just a processor, but the mind is reaching out and out and out and out and out and out. So my my question is for the transhumanists is one, how much of the body do you have to um, copy into the machine to get a human being? Two, how much of the environment do you need to copy into the machine to get a human being? And the last thing I'll say on this is basically the memories we keep in our head are generally most of them are very lossy mm. you only keep the amount of memory you need in your head in order to restore the memory when you're interacting with the thing in the environment that you kept so like i'm a guitar teacher and if you ask someone to explain how they play a song they've learned it's very unlikely they're going to be able to until you put a guitar in their hands mm -hmm. and they're going to use the guitar to gesture where they go mm -hmm. and that's how we do most things including with our own bodies including talking and walking and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think if you took the human brain and just plopped it in a computer, it's like not going to have all its tools. And it's going to have so few of its tools, it's going to be really hard for it to be a human being. Yep. And we, last thing I'll say is we get this when someone's house burns down. If your house burns down, and you've been living there for most of your life. You feel like part of you has died. It's gone. It's been destroyed because it has. Yeah. Because all those little keys to unlock the memories, the photographs, the objects, everything around, all your tools, all the stuff that you use 
to orientate yourself and to trigger memories, you've lost many of the keys to unlock memories in your head that, that are going to be really, really hard to get back. And therefore you've lost a chunk of yourself. Mm. Cool. So I think this all has to be factored into well, I, a human I, being and degrees. Yeah, personally, I accept that. But I, I'm, I will need to pretend to be the transhumanist in this discussion yeah. in order to like prod it, right? To yeah. prod the ideas. Um, I imagine a transhumanist would say, um, however much is required to put in there, if, yeah. if the machine just needs to be more complex in order to accomplish that, all that does is push the time that we achieve that off by another 10 or 15 years or whatever it is. Yeah. So, there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that returns us back to the simulation argument. If the internal yeah. of the um, machine is such a dense and rich environment that it's capable of simulating the complete human environment then it can also simulate the complete human inside it my problem with that is what about like we know that humans can feel we're conscious we have sensation qualia all of that kind of thing Yeah. Yeah. yeah similar to the transportation the transporter problem if we take a human being quote unquote and put it inside a machine quote unquote actually can we be sure that that uh, entity is actually an entity or is it merely a phenomena are you saying like if we copy Victor will the Victor that's you will the human being Victor still be alive if it's in the machine and copy in the machine no I mean if I ma- if we make a copy of me and put it in the machine how do we know the machine Victor actually experiences anything you don't yeah exactly and, and so far um, cool so hopefully that answers the first bit so I am wary of the AI thing for a historical reason as well as, um, as I think I think it's hundreds of years away not decades uh, and I I maybe even put a question if we're ever going to get there because if we go back to like there are stories the oldest story I've ever read um, I think it was 19th century of about talking about making an artificial person. It was a short story, I believe it was called The Dance Partner. I can't remember who wrote it. Mm-hmm. And basically an amazing um, clockwork engineer who's a, lo- a lonely man, builds himself a, a beautiful female dance partner. And it, because it's, a, um, and he goes and takes this, um, this fembot to the, to the local dance. And yeah. it's all clockwork. So this is before the computer age this was written. Mm. And it starts off really well. People are wowed by the grace of this beautiful body, female body uh, that he's dancing with. And they, they think it's a, a, a person. Um, and then, but it doesn't tire because it doesn't have muscles or anything. It's got mm. all this stored energy. So it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. And, and um, it starts to freak people out by <laughs> uncanny valley by the fact that it has inhuman powers. So there's an early conception of it was, okay, if you just had something that moved like a human being, and and this was the age of automata. Yeah, and it's worth uh, noting that the the aristocracy in the kind of 17th and 18th century were completely obsessed with automata. Yeah, that's right. So you got that, and then we realized um, we built some, you know, not very, not amazing ones, but there were, um, there were kind of, museum automata and like I went to Disneyland when I was a kid and I had automata yeah. and things so this, this did get fulfilled up to well, a they, point they had piano and players realized, and letter, letter writers yeah yep. pianolas which are the automatic pianos so um, and you know and even they built um, automata that could play simple musical pieces and things mm-hmm. on violins and stuff so we get there and then people go yeah doesn't quite fulfill my understanding of what a human being is so then we go okay well maybe we need to copy the intellect in some way so if we could just have a computer program that could have a conversation with you so mm-hmm. like when i was a little kid there was that one ask liza or i think it was called or something like that mm-hmm. and we got it worked for a little while and then quickly quickly people adapted to figure out um that uh they could tell it was a robot if they asked the right sort of questions. Sure. They had no intellect. And then, then we had Deep Blue, the, um, the chess playing 
computer that defeated the chess champion. And so it goes on and on. And uh, it gets into things like CG, like um, when Jurassic Park came out with the 1993 with all those CG dinosaurs, they, they looked r like just as good. They looked amazing. And But nowadays, I'm pretty sure anyone can go through who's seen enough movies and go, oh, that's the bit where it's CG and that's the bit where it's a model and that's a bit... Same with Lord of the Rings. And what we get is this ever pushing the boundary further and further away because the AI people never... I've never heard them account for human adaptability. Mm. Human adaptability. Is we always find the way in which the thing is not human. We always find it. And, the, and the, the, the way they program these things is never quite good enough. And it's because we're doing that to each other all the time, but we are adaptable. We're unbelievably adaptable. And these AIs so far have not been. So in the modern age, we're getting into the whole neural stuff. So I've been enjoying on YouTube these uh, ones where a, an AI neural network will hear a piece of a pop song and then try and finish the pop song. Mm. And in some ways it's amazing because it uh, can emulate the sound or you can play it a whole lot of piano pieces and it will create from scratch, from pure sound wave scratch, the sound of pianos. But there's a sense in which it still doesn't know what a piano is, what it <laughs> sounds like. It's sort of like the recipient's always a human being. And even with these, like, the deep fake stuff, like where they get a celebrity and get them to say something, like you watch it a couple of times and then you start noticing the glitches. And it's this noticing the glitches, noticing the glitches, noticing the glitches. Well, and for me, it all just comes down to the central issue of an in, of does it have an internal world or not? I think this is the problem because it doesn't. Maybe that's the reason why it can never adapt like human being, and why we can always. Right. So uh, the and, so that implies that the question is um, that whether or not there will come a time that we can technologically invoke an internal world in an artificial entity, right? And I think the transhumanists accept that we can, and I think the skeptics accept, argue that we can't. And as far I'm not as I'm saying we can't, I'm saying these questions are far from being addressed. And the, the Kurtz Files idea that it's, mm. I don't know what it is, say, 2060 or something. Yeah. It, it's no. I well, we're in a very that. odd situation because we know that we can invoke consciousness through biological reproduction, but because of the complete inability of us to um, invoke consciousness any other way yeah. and because of our co apparent complete lack of progress on the hard problem of consciousness then I don't know how how okay and my ignorance is not a good argument for this but I don't know how we can approach the problem at all well the first thing is we're asking the wrong damn questions which is something I what's my, what my article why you're not just your brain was about mm. It's not just fling more information and more processing at it and hope it comes right. Yeah. It's something more akin to, and like this is as close as I can really get, but it's, it's a, I, think, I think the study of emergence is where it's at. And I think we're only barely just starting to understand emergence because emergence is really, really hard to comprehend. But yeah. anyone who's looked into the, who wants an introduction to it, that, Anyone who's looked into the Mandelbrot set, mm -hmm. that mathematical sort of a paragraph of code um, that you can turn into an image, and the image is infinite, and it's not only infinite, it's infinitely complex, and that arises from a very small amount of code. Um, it's like, so for, here's the thing, from the code, from running the code, you can get to the Mandelbrot set, but it's like we are in the Mandelbrot set, and we're trying to get back to the code, and I, don't think that the maths is possible in that way. You can infer certain things about the code. Mm. You can see repeating patterns. You can see things. But I think it's like we're in the Mandelbrot set and we're trying to get back to the paragraph of code. And I actually think it might be a one-way information street. I think it might not be possible. Yeah, I don't think that it's possible for us to collapse yeah. back down to a simpler dimensional model. I yeah. think we're in a position of only ever That's moving right. outwards. Um, yeah, some of the people in our audience may be saying um, consciousness is only a matter of complexity. 
but I think that Howard Bloom showed that that's simply not the case. If we, like, yes, our brains are the most complex things in the universe, and yes, our brains are the things that uh, have the most consciousness, as far as we can tell, but the fact that those two things are correlated does not necessarily mean that the basis of consciousness is complexity, because if that was the case, we would yep. have to accept that mycelial networks and forests were entirely conscious, and also that... Uh, the Mandelbrot set itself, when it is yeah. activated, is also conscious, seeing as it is also infinitely complex. So I'm definitely getting speculative, speculative and here, but um, yeah, I would say that, um, like, I'm careful about the word consciousness because okay. in, in, in English, at least, when we use that word, we a lot of people just go, "Oh, thinks like a human being." But if we could use the word awareness to be a broader category of things that know they are here and know mm. other things that are here and have behavior and intention and will, mm. then yes, fungal mycelium is absolutely aware. Yeah. Um, it's, it's conscious, but it's not conscious in the way a human being is. Like, as in the world um, lays itself out for fungus or plants or animals, um, in a different way than it lays itself out for a human being and there's we are in this human reality tunnel and the idea that um that this is the only one is, is silly is, yeah uh, when i use the word consciousness i just mean w yeah when i use the word consciousness i just meant like a qualia heifer yeah then i'm 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 at least highly entertaining the concept of panentheism at this stage right well this is so when i was thinking so i thought i'd better do some research for this so i went yeah. on to odyssey to look at some videos and there's one there called the simulation hypothesis which yeah. i recommend to our audience and it comes at and that's by dr incognito yeah and he comes at it at a completely different angle and is that is that you dinging or is that me dinging i can't hear it all right, in that case, it must be me. I'll close one of my browsers and hope that that cures it. <laughs> um, and uh, the simulation hypothesis video makes the argument that uh, in the ancient discussion between, uh, the ancient philosophical argument between materialism or platonic idealism, uh, which ran for 2,500 years, was essentially solved by mo modern physics in favour of idealism and that materialism is no longer a um, plausible explanation of the universe. I am not a physicist, so I have no idea, I have no capacity to determine whether or not that's the case. But it conveniently aligns ourselves with if you accept panentheism, then Platonic idealism is a. If you and and if you accept the um, phys physical uh, physicist proof of Platonic idealism, then those two things line up quite nicely together. Okay. Well, I don't now, know I've watched that, but yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, and from that point, if you accept everything up to that point, the next step is to go. How does this relate to the simulation hypothesis? The way that it relates is, if you accept that everything in the universe is already a form of digitized conscious information, then that's indistinguishable from the simulation hypothesis in the sense that much of the evidence that is presented in the video is presented as though um, it proves that we are running on some kind of substrate, which Gives is he not saying that it amounts to the same thing as being run out of a computer anyway? Yeah, and that's my that's yeah. my problem with it, is it's like, okay, if we say that the universe is a universe, then we haven't yeah. actually learned anything from by that. So I'm always looking for the philosophy or the, or the ideas that are going to give you most agency to do things in the world. So one thing I would address is you talked about materialism versus idealism. Mm. And I'm not a monist either. And I'm not a, not exactly a dualist either. There's a third way. And this was, if you look in alchemy 
And if you look in Kabbalah, and you even look at back to um, old Jewish law and Genesis and that sort of thing, I think they all had a worldview that makes way more sense to me. Given that we're human beings and we can't see all of reality all at once, and we have these different conscious states at different points, so that you can um, sense the the seat pushing back against your bum, the way you're sitting, you can or the way that your body is interacting, or we can be on the world of ideas, or I can be talking to you, which is sound, sound waves and electrical impulses, but that's not the way it's going to into your head. I talk and it goes in as pure ideas. It's like you've already got this quick decoder being, speaking English and that sort of stuff. That it's a spectrum. There's a whole spectrum, if not, and if it's, it might even be like a, a two-dimensional, three-dimensional spectrum of things with materialism, as in that which pushes back against you when you push towards it, or when you kick a rock, it hurts your toes at one point, which is, um, which is like, um, is it Malkus in Kabbalah? Right up to like Keter in Kabbalah, where, which is, um, pure I ideas of, of it's sort of the highest level of things that you can still build a logos around that you can still and then above that are things we can't comprehend so what am I saying that they're both equally true it's a limitation of the human perception that we can't um, explain everything from the point of view of materialism or everything from the point of view of, of abstract ideas but to say that one's more true than the other is doesn't work either. I think this is kind of as good as we got. Now this is like, it may seem airy fairy to people, but it, at least it allows us to operate in the world. I don't think the world arises out of pure matter and I don't think it arises out of ideas. I think there's some h hidden truth to the world and all we mm. can do is operate up and down this ladder from, and there's all sorts of in-between things. Well, okay, what do you make of this suggestion? Yeah. After reading a book on the uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, uh, as far as I could make out what their argument was, was something along the lines of all of the things that we think that could be uh, potential layouts of the universe, like monism, dualism, you know, everything's divine, everything's matter, everything's mm -hmm. consciousness, everything's fire or water, or on, you know, the Heraclitian chaos and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Actually, those are, and I admit this is a monist argument because that's my bias, I suppose, or where I'm sitting at the moment. All of those things look like different explanations, but actually yes. they're just emanations from us, from whatever the single totality is. Yes. yes, that's my understanding, more or less. Basically, we're all looking at an object, and we, we are, and like it's like it's like we're looking at a four-dimensional object, and all we can see is three D slices of it. Yeah, so it can't, we can say, it's like this, and it is, and it's like this, and it is, and it's like this, but we can't put it together because we don't have the four-dimensional uh, conception. Kind of like the ten blind men that found an elephant. Yeah, exactly. So I yeah. think we're kind of stuck in that state because we're we're apes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we just didn't evolve. We're a part of the universe that evolved, but the, we haven't evolved. It's a it's a miracle in a sense, or it's interesting that we evolved so far that we can that we are able to relate to each other like we are now in such a spiritual dimension. And by spiritual, I mean also the world of ideas mm. on such an abstract level as this. And that all of that stuff is real. Mm. Like concepts, philosophical concepts are real. They're different, but they're quite a different type of reality than you get when you bang two rocks together. Mm. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. Yeah. So yeah. I guess... It's, and I guess this is more of a spiritual, like, intuitive understanding of it than a than a logical one. But I kind of feel like the AI people are trying to get a rock to think. Almost, sort of. <laughs> and it's like well, it's not clear why we shouldn't be able to do that. But it's like you're at the wrong end of the. It's almost like you're at the wrong wrong end of the scale. But other than that, I can only really put that forth intuitively and not logically. 
Well, here's my uh, pragmatic angle. I can explain one other way, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, my pragmatic angle is if I was interested in the invocation of consciousness and I was an AI researcher, transhumanist, I would change my mind and have kids instead because that seems like it was going to be <laughs> far less effort. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but I agree with you, except that it's also a bit of a cop-out, isn't it? I mean, the problem. It, doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem, but it, no. oh, but it does... Yeah. yeah, but it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll explain the problem in another way. Uh, we are currently looking at each other on a computer screen, mm -hmm. and I presume everyone's going to be consuming this content through a computer. So at the moment, um, I can see Victor, um, even though this is an audio podcast because we we are looking at each other on video, and I see him. And he, I see Victor. I see the shape of his head and I see his beard and et cetera and what he's wearing and everything. Um, except that that's an illusion. If we were materialists, we'd go in and we go in and if I stared at the screen closer and closer and closer, there's a point at which the Victor Logos would disappear and I start seeing individual points of coloured light. Um, so, Victor, in a sense, the, the, the picture of Victor seems like an optical illusion Except that if I was really seeing Victor in the room, it's actually the same same problem. Mm. It's like I've seen the outline of Victor. Now, does this mean that Victor, as a as a man with with a two toned beard and a sort of and, and a particular shape to his body and everything, wearing a singlet and wearing some headphones, does that mean that that isn't real? No bullshit. That's all real. Mm. It's just not. Um, there's a point at which. If I zoom in close to Victor in the screen, he dis the Victorness disappears out of it, and it becomes individual pixels. But also, like, if I got too close to Victor, which would feel <laughs> uncomfortable, he'd also cease to he'd become a wall of skin at some point, you know, or just a blotch of color, or eventually just I won't be able to see him if I get too close. It's the same problem, and it but it doesn't mean that Victor as a as a body doesn't exist. Um. I don't, example I use often is if there's a picture of a rose on your screen and you zoom in, you'll, it will turn into individual pixels of colour. And but, but when you see the rose on the screen, it, it hits you immediately. That's a rose. You don't go, oh, that's individual points and pieces. And my argument is if you see a rose in a garden, it's actually the same. The only difference is you can reach out and touch it. Mm. potentially but say you weren't allowed to visually it's also it's a thing that could be argued to be made of smaller things so this point at which an extraction certain concepts appear and certain logos appears a lot and i think the thing that's wrong is to say that only the pixels are real and that the rose is an optical illusion only as i say as a symbol as a symbolic thing we can interact with the rose is real Mm. this is the same problem as the problem of form and actuality when we look at a rose to what degree is it actually a rose and what degree is it a collection of you know the material of the universe into a certain shape is the shape of it the thing that makes it the rose or is it the matter that makes it the thing which is the rose no if you lost either of those arguments the rosiness both. of it would disappear it's both because I can say yeah. draw a rose from your imagination yeah and you, one you know that it means and you probably know how to do that up to a certain skill level do you know what i mean and that's working yeah. from the top down but if i say well build a rose out of points of light on a or you know what i mean you could build yeah. it from the smallest things or you could bring it and you could manifest it from the more abstract and they both work and we operate up and down the scale as human beings all the time so i don't think we live in a world that entirely comes out from either points of information or points of matter and i don't think we live in a world that entirely um everything condenses out of from pure idea space either i think we both and the problem <laughs> like we're just i'm, I'm incapable of of seeing it from more than one point of view at a time all right, let me tr ask you a question, which I think can illustrate this yeah. um, 
central issue that we're oscillating around uh, in an interesting way. Is the thing that gives the universe its shape a material object or not? Both. <laughs> right? And now, it's just like, people, I know that you're laughing and I know that people listening are going to get unsatisfied with me. And on, on, um, on one level, it's like, didn't, don't ask a wizard. But on the, other <laughs> level, on the other level, like, like I think the problem is as human beings, we can't, we can't see the reality directly. So it's always going to look like one space or the other. The strange thing is that we can, as human beings, um, come from, that we can, we can talk about it at all and we can talk about it from an idea situation or from a material situation. Mm. And this is why one of the fundamental magical skills is the ability to dimension shift between different perspectives of, on yeah. any particular thing. So when yeah. we look at an object, the rose or the universe or whatever it is, our ability to see it and analyze it on material, energetic, divine, emotional, sensory, uh, and informational, or any other variety of levels. Ove et coagula, right? Mm -hmm. For the alchemists in the audience, this is what it's trying to explain. It's part of what it means. It means a few things, but one of the things it means is that um, you can solve something material into idea space, and you can coagulate something from idea space down into the material. Mm. And this is, this to me is a beautiful way to explain the like creative process for instance mm. as well as language and a lot many things so the question i guess getting back to ai is part of the problem is that ai is entirely designed and computers are entirely designed for to appeal to humans it's like how do we know when the experiment's done it's because a human likes it or accepts it mm. And for it to be a true consciousness experiment, the computer needs to make its own judgments about when it's done, when it's reached consciousness, right? And at that point, how can you really possibly, is that going to be satisfying to a human being anyway? Mm. Does that make sense or am I getting too vague? And there's a certain vagueness there, but you are still making sense. I don't think you've completely dissipated into a Heraclitian <laughs> chaos just yet. Yeah. Here's the thing: if if we can if we accept that there's a perspective on the universe which reviews everything as uh, conscious slash divine, why are we having so much difficulty in invoking consciousness in in matter? Um. Well, I mean that that is the hard problem, but I think in some ways. We're missing. We're missing the recipe, kind of. We're missing. I mean, to to get really belligerent about it, there's there's no like matter's a useful fiction in a sense. Maybe not matter, but atoms are. <laughs> like, sure. if you ask it, if you ask a high level physicist, um, and I think this is where scientism stuffs up science. Scientism yeah. being the misapplication of science. Mm. understanding of it so if you really ask a high level quantum physicist it's like um is an atom a useful fiction they'll say yes mm. to my understanding mm -hmm. it's not it's a framework we put around things so that we can prod and push them and experiment on them but an atom is not necessarily any more real than a song Does it make sense? Yes. If if we accept that, then we kind of are in the space of having to accept that science is reasoning by analogy because yep. we are always operating from a position of consciousness and consciousness yep. it recognizes the universe via the means of overlaying sets of previously recognized patterns and mm -hmm. getting an intuitive vibe about which ones of those patterns are closer or further away, which is also why learning is so important because one of the primary yeah. aspects of learning is learning new patterns that we can apply. 
yeah, why paradigm shifts are so hard to come by. Why coming into a new way to explain patterns mm. is so hard to do and only happens occasionally. I imagine that well, that the scientists in our audience might be slightly offended by the idea that all of their extremely rigorous and um, well thought out experiments can never get beyond the concept, uh, beyond the fact of analogy. Well, that I'm so like. <laughs> I, I mean, Gödel's incompleteness, incompleteness theorem. I, I've heard of it, but I never really understood it. Really? Oh, this is important. Um, and I'm going to do a slightly piss poor job of explaining it, but go go look it up. Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, Gödel showed something like you can't fully explain a system while you are in it. You have to, to fully, fully understand a system, you have to take an observation point outside of it which creates an infinite regress after a certain point well the problem with that is in order to check in on the system you, to see if you were right you would have to make contact with it right yes so either yeah and you can't fully understand it while you're operating as part of it so he, there's a more mathematical way basically he showed this as a mathematical proof he proved if, before this people thought if we just had enough information mathematics could uncover all the secrets of the universe mm. he showed with a mathematical proof that there are limitations to what even mathematics can calculate uh, in, in comprehending a system and uh, my understanding is after he published this several um Prominent man, mathematicians committed suicide. Oh my god! It was such a it was such an end. It was such a um, death knell to the to to this whole line of knowledge that went back to the ancient Greeks, if not back further. You know. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe. I mean, I'm not saying this to make anyone give up. N not that they would. <laughs> People, we should be trying. We should be trying to stick around with AI and everything but it uh, there are limitations to the kinds of questions maths can answer there's limitations to the kinds of questions uh, science can answer and I think we might just be so placed that we there's certain there's certain things we're never going to get a complete answer to because we are human beings because we're stuck in this point which is kind of like gets you finally coming full circle to the whole Douglas Adams deep thought idea. It's like, okay, well, we can't even ask the right questions because we can't see where we are. Let's build a computer to do that for us. And then the, and then the computer will come back to you. And this is, I think, what Douglas Adams was making fun of and go, yeah, um, well, the answer is 42. <laughs> have you figured out what the question is? And they're like, no, like, what does that mean? And then they have built a compu bigger computer to try and figure out what the question for the answer was. And it's sort of like this thing, you could, you could calculate that and have it come back to you and still not really understand it. Anyway, I, 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 su I have a s suspicion that we might be there as, we might be in that place as human beings. We can do a lot, but we can only, only perhaps travel up and down this ladder of reality from abstract to from conscious to material from ideal to to from the ideal to the atomistic mm. and we it's because we can never quite see reality directly perhaps that's not how i'd phrase it but i see what you're getting at yeah yeah i would phrase it more like because we're always already um, have an intersubjective relationship with everything yes. that is real as we are yeah. there's no zero point from which to measure everything from or something like that no place to get outside of the system to look at it yeah there's um, no quantifiable way to say that a concept is less real than an atom or an atom's more real than a concept um, unless you impose arbitrary rules on it like 
while the atom's easier to measure, therefore, therefore it's, more, it's easier to say where it starts and ends, and therefore it's more real than a song. Well, songs move through the world and have effects on people and find a viable and get reproduced. Do you know what I mean? And when you and get, get your ruler out to do the measurement, guess what you're using? A bunch of concepts that are written on the ruler. So, yes, exactly. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're not getting out. But I do want to say... Yeah. Um, the fact that we have this problem at the moment doesn't mean that it's an, an, that the solution space can't be expanded no, as no. we use um, magical um, psyche based and scientific methods to expand our capacities as yeah. entities we can expand the potential so- solution space so I, so even if we can never reach a final conclusion i also think that we can continually expand the amount of solution space that that will keep going and that there will never be an end point where that's where we kind of cease expanding the zones of investigation that we yeah, open up I, I think we should tr- yeah i agree with you and um i think we should optimistically try mm. but i'm just saying it it's possible that we're in this kind of space where and I think I've exp- and during this podcast, I think I've been quite vague and I've jumped from here to here and here and here, but I, hopefully you, people can see what I mean um, if they understand something like the Man- Mandelbrot set. If you're in the Mandelbrot set, how do you find the code? If you're, um, if, you're in the, if you're in the human body, it's like, how do you, how do you quite know what where your humanness starts and ends like how much of the human body do you need to copy in order for it to be become a full model of a human being what else do we talk it's i'm always sort of getting to these points of there's the um how do you know you, what ha, where a system fully the full extent of a, a system unless you're outside of it unless you're able to get outside of it and draw around the edges of it mm. it's all the, it's all the same kind of answer because it's a, it is a vague <laughs> concept we're trying to get it in but to people kind of i hope people kind of understand how i'm trying to explain a a difficulty i think i i mean we have a sophisticated audience i think i don't think that we've will have lost anyone yeah um but it's interesting to see how philosophers have come to uh, similar conclusions in the past right Mm -hmm. heidegger's investigation into what being is Kant's critiques of practical and pure reason and you know all the way back to uh, the platonic forms and even the pre-socratic philosophers lots of them have touched on aspects of or elucidated in far greater detail and far more usefully than I have right now about uh, what the issue is about how to deal with the fact that uh, we're not quite sure where our consciousness is arising from So there's another problem in philosophy that's tangentially related, which is that um, in philosophy we are using almost entirely language to explain philosophical concepts, and that can get you in a kind of Wittgenstein-style trap where you start to believe that what you're doing is using language to explain language Mm. and that philosophy is language, and I don't think that's true at all. I'm glad to hear you say that because I also think that's nonsense. Yeah, you're, yeah. I think that's people mistaking the medium for for w- what the medium's trying to explore. Yeah, and I think this is the same, potentially the same type of issue we're getting when we get in trouble of like, what, at, how much matter do I have to create before I um, or shift around until I get a conscious thing. Well, for me, it's quite sim- the evidence of the of that being an incomplete explanation is quite simple, yeah. which is that if you say a word, words have the emotional resonances of them as well as the mm. strict formal definitions of them. So, the if if it was in fact the case that um, it was impossible to properly explain things because every uh, word points to another word or every signifier points to a, the a signified and the signifieds are also only pointing to other signifieds then we wouldn't be able to communicate at all and we can communicate so it seems yeah. like a non-starter for me apologies to yeah. Wittgenstein I'm yeah. 
very likely I've only completely misunderstood what he was actually on about. But if that's what he was talking about, then that's that seems like a non-starter. And we can say a similar thing for Derrida and Foucault as well, in exactly the same way that Derrida, uh, Derrida makes the argument that you know yep. we can't get out of the problem of signs pointing at um, signifiers pointing at the signified that would always point back again or in the yeah. same way that Foucault says we can't get out of power relations because everything is a power relation that is in a power relation with other power relationships it's like no 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 we're complete human beings that are fully involved in a massively complex system and trying to place these limits on because things point to each other is a, a uh, autistic in the strict sense of that term error around, yeah. about rejecting that can, is only plausible if we deliberately re- reject huge quantities of the evidence of our eyes and experience. Yeah. Cool. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, about, that is, that's about as pinned down as I'm going to be able to get on the subject. And I've had these kind of, these kind of conversations, I think, can go two ways. Um, either people start to end up understand at a certain point or they just get really really pissed off with me that mm. i won't accept such and such a detail or such and such a detail well what's the strongest form of the argument that you are not accepting well if, if the problem is we're even sort of dancing around a collection of issues that maybe we haven't completely pinpointed but i think mostly we've been dancing around can consciousness arise out of matter right yeah yeah and, and and we can and we know that there's a there can be an overlap between consciousness and matter because we are material beings that are conscious. So there's yeah. one data point, right? Absolutely, but yeah. yeah, but also we only, like I said earlier, we only have one known method of invoking consciousness, and all of the other f- versions. And to be clear, there has been many, many, many ver- attempts at invoking consciousness in things. What do you mean by we only have one way of invoking consciousness? I mean. Biological reproduction. Biological reproduction, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and all of the other versions have failed, unless you're willing to go back to our previous discussion about egregores and accept that those are conscious, but I'm not sure that they are conscious no, in the like way that I mean it. They are definitely are. They just operate in the world. It's, it's like the AI on the computer, right? Mm-hmm. It, it operates as though it was. It can, operates as if it was to a human being watching it. Well... Mm. Same with idea constructs. They can look like spirits to being watching them, but we'll never get to the bottom of whether they um, haven't. But they they ne- they seem to need our our mental hardware to manifest in the world. Yeah. They seem to. If there was also seem to operate on, on under their own wants. So. And I, I don't think we can get to the bottom of that. This is why I sometimes call things spirits if I'm talking to one group of people, mm-hmm. and I sometimes call them idea constructs or memes that appear to have will power to another group of people. And, um, um, would you accept the suggestion that that set of phenomena would have zero existence if human consciousness didn't exist? I that well, we don't know, but. Um, yeah, the spirit sort of implies that they're there anyway and idea constructs sort of implies that they're not there unless we think them up unless we're passing between our heads or whatever mm. uh, and as a pragmatist I'm most interested what change you can actually do in the world so I also wrote an article called Believing Things on Different Days and anyone who really is <laughs> I'm always looking for the outcomes and I'm always going to take the line of thinking that's going to get me to some outcome. And I think this is, again, I, this is probably why I piss people off a little bit, if they want me to get down to one point of view. I think if you don't have a complete model, all you can do is switch between models mm. and, and what you're measuring is what you can do. So I've had a couple of experiences where I've talked to spirits and I've interacted with other people um, who are going through some problem, like they might be... They might feel compelled by a, by something that only they can hear to 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 see something or hear something or believe something's true. And I find often the spirit paradigm is more useful to talk to them in. But I find other times the idea that 
that they're, they're functioning with I ideas or sub-personalities of themselves. So the question is, like, if you're talking to a spirit, are you talking to part of yourself? Or are you talking to an idea that's piggybacking on your hardware in order to manifest itself? And it'll just be sitting there as a dormant thing, like a virus is a dormant thing until it reaches a host cell? Or is it a actual mind without a body that pops down and interacts with us? Or is it a, another being from another dimension? And there's no clear way to, to pinpoint these things, but all cultures that believe in spirits that I've come across seem to have a paradigm for creating spirits, um, just as all cultures that understand creativity in our way understand that you can like, I could write a pop song that gets stuck in your head, an earworm, and it b bounces from head to head and head to head to head. Now I think that's, I think they're all kind of variations on the same thing. Hmm. Um, does that mean my, if I write a song that jumps from head to head and gets stuck and has people whistling it, is it the willpower of the song to do so? That's the, that's the kind of issue we have. I'm, I'm thinking of it as an analogy, I would say that earworms are more like viruses, whereas spirits are more like animals, right? Theoretically, they occupy the same kind of grand domain but actually they're quite different substances it would be really hard to tell the difference you think so oh yeah like a santa claus a spirit we talked about this last time we did and i think we decided yes but yeah but an earworm and santa claus are quite different because an earworm's existence is something more singular more, yeah. singular, more fragile more focused whereas santa claus exists as a yeah. much greater fully mythologized and fleshed out creature that implies a certain variety of world as santa could santa claus be described as a bunch of airworm like ideas that are connected together only so long as you can say that the human being is a multi-celled bacteria which glues together huge numbers yeah. of cells right yeah, same scale it, you know it's yeah, same scale of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, so, here's what, from a mental health perspective, <laughs> as to not drive yourself mad, sometimes it's more useful to consider uh, some hurtful bad ideas that you have in your mind as being you something you came up with, sometimes it's more useful to think of it as a sub-personality, draw a boundary around it so that it's um, easier for you to say, I don't want those ideas and pinpoint what they are. And I think some clinical studies, which I've written about in, um, in another article about spirits on pragmatic thinking, pragmatic magical thinking, some suggest that people who are schizophrenic who live in cultures that have a spirit paradigm actually do better when when they can pinpoint all those voices in the head as not coming from themselves. And I'd say just as a pragmatist, it's because they can go, I don't want that. I, that's, that's that nasty demon Michael or whatever. And, and my, um, shut up, Michael, and leave my head. Yeah, for people who are interested in schizophrenia, um, I would recommend to you uh, chapter 5 of Culliano's book which I released just a little while ago which is um, a fantastic discussion of the relationship between the mind, magic and uh, schizophrenia yeah. um, but I can maybe I will give a quote of like a, a paragraph or so that will help isolate exactly where Culliano is coming from he says to be sure there is a remote analogy between magic methods and the mental illness called schizophrenia, the two however cannot be confused with each other. True the magician must be convinced of his capacity to transmit his own emotions to another subject or to perform other transitive actions of that kind, but he never ceases to be aware that the phantasmagoria he has produced function exclusively on the terrain belonging to phantasms, namely the human imagination. 
This seems to be all the more true since there are cases, very rare, in which the person suffers obvious symptoms of schizophrenia, which differentiates him at once from the mass of other magicians who are completely sane. In a schizophrenic performer of magic, the inner phantasmagoria finally gained the upper hand like a foreign presence. Now let us remember that Giordano Bruno never ceased to alert the manipulator of phantasms to the dangers involved in his activi activity, which collectively amounted to the loss of mental health. Thus it seems the magician must not be regarded as schizophrenic in principle, nor magic as institutionalised schizophrenia. On the contrary, there are analogies between certain types of magic and psychoanalysis itself, who, whose method permits within limits a comparison with the method of Gio, Giordano Bruno's healers. Yeah, I wonder if, I, I like that idea and that's the same one I subscribe to more or less. I'm just wondering if there's a, a simpler way to put it. Um, one way to look at it is to come from the materialist angle. Mm -hmm. Um, when, so here's an easier example that we can then analogize into spirits. It's very, very difficult to tickle yourself. And the reason it's difficult to tickle yourself is that when you're, um, say you tickle the palm of your hand with your fingertips, the other hand, uh, one thing that's happening is you're sending a signal to wiggle your fingers to tickle yourself and then you're getting a sensation that's creeping up through your other arm. And then there's a third thing, which is there's another signal sent to say, ignore this, ignore this um, message because we've sent it ourselves. Mm. So one of the materialist ideas of um, why schizophrenia is a problem, well, and uh, okay, I'm not, not just schizophrenia, hearing voices why hearing voices is an issue from the point of view of a psy psychiatrist or psychologist is that when you have an argument with yourself in your head and i think most people do this there's a like a, it's it's piggybacking on your um language parts of your brain to be able to do that but there's also a message being sent saying ignore the idea that this is someone else like it's triggering your audio receptors to my understanding when you imagine sound mm. and when you imagine language it's it's triggering your language receptors so the only reason we when you argue with yourself that you know it's you is because there's this extra message being sent going um oh this is us <laughs> this is this is this yeah. is our, our own brain doing or our mind doing it um and the idea is that that is lopped off or missing from the schizophrenic and that many schizophrenics are able to treat themselves um, through therapies where they start to understand all the different personalities that they have in their head that feel like different people they can feel as real as um, one having a conversation with their friend start to realize oh this is part of myself oh this is part of myself oh this is part of myself really adds a whole new layer of meaning to Jung's concept of the integration of the shadow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the people have uh, become functional yeah. this way. Um, and not only understanding that, oh, that voice that always um, like gets really hysterical and swears and swears at me, that's actually a part of myself that's trying to protect myself because it's afraid of this thing. It's a complex. So stuff like that. So... Yeah. Again, it seems like I've, I've reversed my angle, but I really think that we're looking... It's just, what are you trying to get done? Are you trying to be a schizophrenic uh, who... Sorry, are you, are you a schizophrenic who's trying to get along in the world where most other people aren't? Then it might be useful to see all your voices as part of yourself. Or are you a um, non-schizophrenic who has deep, deep anxiety and cyclic thinking, like um, suicidal ideation or something like that? It might actually be useful to go, actually, these are the thoughts I don't want. I'm going to draw a line around them, give, recognize them as a subpersonality, give it a name, and then form, a, form a, a power relationship with it where I can either tell it to piss off or, yeah. uh, you know, or nurture it like a child taking <laughs> to behave, behaving properly or 
or exercise it or in some way. It's like, what are you trying to get done? I think all of these things are equally valid. Mm. I think the model is secondary to what you're trying to get done. Well, I agree, right? Returning yeah. to the idea of uh, why it's important to be able to implement certain uh, paradigms at will over certain yeah. phenomena because it gives you the ability to have a pragmatic relationship. Not that it doesn't also have a danger inside it as well. I've seen some practitioners of chaos magic go off the rails because they get so good at implementing whichever variety of um, beliefs they want to have about the situation yeah. that they just instantly reinterpret anything that happens to them in the way that most pleases their ego and they rapidly wow. become extremely egotistical and also very unfunctional people because yeah. their interpretation of reality doesn't mesh in the slightest with anybody else's, right? Yeah, I've thought of this too. So, um, yeah, so there's another chapter I've written called, um, a bit, I, I, what did I call it? It's a... Uh, an alternative approach to being a skeptic, an updated approach to being a skeptic, which is that, um, say you want to find out if a piece of magic really works. Let's say you want to find out what I do. I learned tarot. I learned tarot basically on a, sort of on a deer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and coming from it from a point of view of someone who didn't understand it. Um, a friend of mine showed me that it delivered really good results and he was the first person who ever did. Since then I've met other people who can do good fortune telling. So I learned the system. While I learned the system, I made sure that I was not bringing any doubt into the situation or not telling myself what it was happening until I understood the system on its own terms. So the first thing you got to do is be charitable. Um, so I say, look, put a number of weeks aside, however long it takes to learn the system on its own terms. So if you're learning tarot, put aside the amount of time it takes to do your first, uh, at least your first really good reading. And what I mean is, can you as a performance, give someone else a uh, reading and have them go, oh yeah, you really know more than I expected you to know. Are you still there? Yep. Yep. I'm listening. And, cool. And there's some weird noises that were happening in between. Uh, that was my phone. I have to put on do, do not disturb now. Okay. So first, uh, yeah, be charitable to the situation. Try and understand what it is you're trying to understand on its terms. Second, change hats. Go somewhere else <laughs> away from the person who taught it to you, away from anyone you would offend, um, and then try and take it apart. So. I, start, I use tarot to try and uh, predict the results of a sports game that doesn't work. It's the conclusion I came to. Uh, it doesn't win you lotto. Mm -hmm. It does unbelievably good readings of how people feel about the situation. It's extremely good for counseling. What else did I do? I watched a TV show and I, I asked the tarot cards that I turned over to help me explain what the motivations of, were the, of the various characters in the show were, what their motivations were and that worked extremely well mm. and i haven't heard of anyone else who's doing tarot use it that way later on i did the same experiments with the etching um which is very similar but in some ways but gives it's like talking to a very different character mm. and i was uh yeah ask, i just sort of ask people if they who i invite people to have a reading from me when i feel like it <laughs> and uh so I did a few fortune telling type readings, but then I was on a chat with a friend of mine who's a single mother, and I asked her what, she said, oh yeah, I'm interested in this I Ching thing. I said, cool, do you have a question? And she said, yeah, I, the question I want answered more than anything right now is what should I make for dinner? I'm like, I said, cool, that, well you're asking the right person because that's fine by me, because I feel like that we should mess around with this stuff and <laughs> understand it. Um, but that, but are you sure that's the question you want to ask? He's like, yeah, actually, like that's the thing that's most stressing me out right now. I'm like, oh, cool, okay. Somehow we got a chicken recipe out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I said, well, there's this thing sort of alludes to potatoes, and this thing sort of alludes to rice. 
I think. I said, do you have those things? She's got, yeah, I've got both those things, but I've got no idea how to make a dish with potatoes and rice. I said, well, that's easy. You just make Persian rice. She's like, what? Well, you put potatoes in the bottom of the pan and some oil, and then you put on the rice cooker, and then you put the rice on top, and and she's like, so she, and then if you can find some dill, you put that in it, and then you get your potatoes and your rice. And she made it for her boys, and they really, really liked it. And she said, yeah, that actually works really well. <laughs> <laughs> modern like solutions it, require modern problems <laughs> and it's, it's like my interactions with the I Ching especially but also tarot have been that way mm. where it, you can it often does work for things that seem a little irreverent and silly so first try and understand things on their own terms in the in the way uh, in the tradition which is where i think some chaos magicians fall over they're trying to take stuff apart before they've understood it and it's where a lot of skeptics fall over for the same reason. Then go somewhere else, change hats, try and take it apart, see if it predicts this, see if it predicts that. And then just keep a note of what it does and doesn't do. So I now know uh, tarot is a great party trick. It can help some friends through some emotional issues, just like counseling. It doesn't properly predict people's future or not super directly. It more explains to people how they feel about the future or the mm. past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I can see how the the utility of uh, we need a convenient word for or a fra turn of phrase. What do you call it when you switch from one variety it, of perspective, world perspective, to yeah. another? I call it spiritual code switching. Okay, so I th one of the thing. I think that spiritual code switching is so useful that um, it also inversely explains why ideologues piss us off so much. <laughs> <laughs> like when you meet someone who has a really strict perspective on the world and um, whether they're unwilling or unable, both piss you off, but both, but for different reasons. But the reason why I think that pisses us off so much is because we have a natural urge to be able to do some code switching just because the utility is so good. So when you yeah. meet someone who is like a really strict historical materialist or, a, yeah. or any other variety of sort of thing, that offensiveness comes out of you because you're like, for God's sake, look at the world and how chaotic it is. It's so foolish and pointless to insist on a single interpretation. And vice versa. Like I... I... I occasionally accidentally piss off these types of people who really want the world to be um, summable, to be understood on black and white terms. Well, I mean, those people are asking to be offended by existence, and if you just happen to be the part of existence that offends them, I don't see how that's going to be... I don't see how that's on you. Thanks, I guess. So, um, simulation hypothesis, yes slash no. Black and white answer, please. <laughs> um, not useful. Not useful, okay. Not right now. Yeah. <laughs> Great, do you have anything else to say on the topic? Um, no, I think that gets through. I think I not only went through a bunch of things, but possibly rambled a little bit <laughs> sure all right i'm going to stop the recording